My name is Phil. I'm glad to have you here. I've just been thinking a lot recently that I think, and if you're a public school teacher or you're involved in teaching, there's something we need to add to public education, and that's social etiquette. Like, we should create public social etiquette courses again in school. And I don't mean like the things where you figure out which fork to use during a meal or where to place your napkins and all that. I mean how to interact in public environments as if other people exist. Are you with me on that? Anybody else agree? Uh, so think, yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. I feel like I'm out on a limb here. Anyhow. <laughs> So think about uh, public transportation. I know we don't have a lot of public transportation, but maybe you've flown on a plane before. You could see some crazy stuff flying on a plane. Because like people forget, this is not your personal vehicle. If people show up, so I, I've seen things, I've seen videos, I've seen photos of things. For instance, somebody reaching in front of the seat, like past the seat in front of them to shut someone's window because the glare, they don't like the glare. That's not your window. Or the, I saw the, a photo of this lady. She draped her hair, really long hair. She draped it over the seat so it's literally like hanging in front of the person behind her over their tray where they put their food. Like this, there's other people here. Or somebody who props their feet up on the armrest of somebody's chair in front of them. I, I saw this photo, no lie. I saw this photo of an individual who was laying on their seat in the airplane and their feet were up with no socks or shoes on. Their feet were up at the buttons where you call for assistance. Like, besides that, there's a whole thing we need to address. Stop taking your shoes and socks off at the airport. It's not your personal vehicle. Like, they, don't let, they don't let weapons into airplanes or airports. This guy somehow made it through TSA with his machete toenails laced in fungus, just waving them through his socks like he doesn't care. How did that happen? And some lady's over here in her nightgown. This is not your car. There's other people here. What's going on with that? So think beyond that, not just transportation, but you know how frustrating it is when you go to the grocery store and there's a cart in the middle of the parking lot, or you turn to go into a parking spot, and there's a cart in the middle of the parking spot. I was talking to my buddy the other day. He stopped in at Hornings, and in the middle of the conversation, he paused to express to me his frustration of just observing a person set their cart free, and it crash into three vehicles. Like, what's going on with that? There's, there's all of these components. Now, I haven't seen a TikTok dancer in the wild. I haven't seen them in the wild. But I'm curious about how, what's going on there. An individual who is blocking traffic or stopping somebody from getting their Taco Bell order or whatever it is so they can film their TikTok dance. Like, excuse me, ma'am, I just need to get a ticket here at the DMV because I want to get on with my day. Sorry to interrupt your video, your dance. Like, I haven't seen it in the wild, but that's occurring in our society. What's happening there? What I think is occurring is arrogance. The concept that I alone exist in the world and I don't consider anybody else around me. And I'm not, listen, I understand that whole illustration is probably a little self-righteous and, you know, me thinking I'm better than other people. And I, I'm not the bastion of humility. I'm not standing up here as the bastion of humility. But the reality is I long for it. And I think we long for it in our society. We want to see humility. We want to see humility in our leaders. We want to see humility in pastors and religious directors or leaders. We want to, you think about the concept of celebrities. They have acquired the skill of memorizing a script and dramatically reciting that script back to us. And somehow we've come to believe, or they've come to believe, they are the standard on all things and should be the voices in our lives on all things. We want humility. We long for it. And the truth is God longs for it. God celebrates humility. Not only does he celebrate it, he exalts it. We as a culture, we want to see humility, but so does God. So we've been in the series for the last few weeks. It's been quite some time. Just looking at what do the heavens celebrate? What causes the heavens to break out and party? One of those things is humility. And Jesus will share a story with us, a parable, that 
emphasizes this truth that God longs for humility. He celebrates it. And in fact, he exalts it. He lifts up those who are humble. Luke sets up the story for us. He says, he, Jesus, also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. So Luke gives us a a baseline or some background or context for why Jesus even tells the parable. And he says the context is there were people, not just religious leaders, they were the culprits typically, but people in their society and people really in every society to come after who trusted in themselves. They had two fatal flaws, two fatal flaws of pride. And I'm sure there are other fatal flaws, but there are two that are addressed here according to Luke. One, trusting in ourselves. He says they trusted in themselves that they were righteous. That they believe somehow they could find right standing with the holy, perfect God on their own. And it's a flaw because you and I are incapable of standing right before God on our own. We all stand unrighteous before a holy and perfect God. And it is a flawed idea to think that somehow if I can just do enough good or I can in performance-based righteousness achieve God's acceptance, it's a flaw because we can't. And I would argue... That trusting in myself for anything is a flaw. The the idea that I am somehow self-sufficient, there is one self-sufficient being in the universe. That's God himself. Everybody else, you and myself included, he has to put breath in my lungs. He has to hold me together. So the very concept of self-sufficiency is a flawed idea. The second is looking down on everyone else. The flaw in that is it creates a fabricated measurement, a measurement in which we look at others to determine where we stand, but what I can do in that measurement is I could shift the bar. I could find someone that I deem myself to be better than and see the bar shifting The problem is the bar is the holy and perfect God, and we all fall short of that. So in this arrogance, these individuals had a flawed perspective. So Jesus tells a parable. It says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself, God I thank you that I'm not like other people, greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. Here's a man, a Pharisee, a religious leader, who prays about himself. The translation that I use here, Christian Standard Bible, says prays about himself. The, the NIV says a similar concept, but there are other translations that translate what at the core of the language, the Greek language presented, was almost that he prayed to or toward himself. It was like he wasn't even talking to God, he was talking to himself. And it makes sense in the context of what he says, all he does is talk about himself. He even says, God, I thank you, but thanks implies gratitude for something received. All he talks about is what he's earned. He's speaking to or about himself. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not wrong for us to pray concerning ourselves. I'm not saying that it's wrong for us to to pray concerning ourselves. What I think we often do when we take the concept of humility We get this idea that humility is simply someone who is quiet, or even more than that, humility is somebody who is self-deprecating. And humility is not self-deprecation. I am not humble if I destroy the image of myself. Here's what I believe humility is. Paul says this, he says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think of yourself sensibly. Well, what is a sensible view of myself? A sensible view of myself is one never devoid of Jesus and my standing with or without him. 
So when I view myself through the lens of Jesus, I actually can have a very high view of myself because Jesus says in him, I am righteous, I am holy, I'm a saint, I'm an heir, I'm a child of God, and on and on and on you could go. He declares that about me. So my view of myself is very, very high, but it's never devoid of him. Humility is understanding who I am with Jesus and who I was without him. It's not a self-deprecating view. You can actually argue that an individual who has a very negative, Eeyore, sort of self-deprecating view of of their own image, there's arrogance in that too. Because self is still at the center of the conversation. It's still all about me, and it's still about drawing attention to me. My view of myself remains high, but it's directly connected and always involves a perspective of myself that includes God. It's built on who God says I am and what God has said about me. So this Pharisee has this very broken view of himself. And he's speaking to himself, and he says, I'm thankful you've not made me like other people. Now, on one level, there's accuracy to that. You are individually unique. One cell from your father found one cell from your mother and began writing a genetic code that has never been written in history and never will be written again. You are absolutely unique. There is nobody like you, will never ever be anybody like you. God crafted you that way. But when it comes to the context, when it comes to the perspective of who I am in the eyes of God in righteousness, we are all the same. For him to say, I'm so glad I'm not like other people in the framework of right standing with God, it was inaccurate. Because when it comes to right standing with God, all of us have fallen short, all of us have sinned and missed the mark that God has for us. What happens in this fatal flaw is that we begin to focus on what we are not while ignoring what we are. He says, I'm glad I'm not like other people, and even points to the tax collector. I'm so glad I'm not like him. But I'm sure there were things that he was that he actually could have talked to God about. Don't we do that? Oh, I'm so glad I don't do that. I'm so glad I'm not that. And it's real easy to look at the evil outside of me than actually address the evil inside of me. The fatal flaw of arrogance is to look outside and focus on what I am not and miss the things that I am. My measurement is not other people. My measurement is the holy standard of God. What we also do is we focus on the things that we do while ignoring the things that we don't. Now, I recognize Jesus is giving us a parable He's limiting the details of that parable. He's not getting to every possible detail. But it strikes me as intriguing that this Pharisee only lists two things that he does. And the two things that he lists are sort of momentary things that can be done and walked away from. So he says, I fast twice a week. Now, that's not necessarily momentary. But what he's saying is in two sunrise cycles, I don't eat stuff. But he could be absolutely miserable, probably more so because he's hangry. He could be absolutely miserable in that moment and treat people like garbage, but momentarily I didn't eat stuff. You see what I'm saying? We could focus on what we do while missing what we don't. He says, I give a tenth of everything that I have. Jesus addressed that. Jesus said to the Pharisees, woe to you, you tithe on a tenth of everything all the way down to your spices, yet you miss the things that matter most, justice, mercy, and taking care of those who are in need. He says those things matter more. So this man could say, listen, I, I for a moment give a tenth of everything that I have, but I treated the merchant that I bought the spices from like he was less than me. This sounds a lot like, well, I go to church. I give to charity. 
I'm not saying, those are good things. They should occur. But we can look at momentary things and say, well, look at what I do in a way of ignoring the things that we don't. Now, hear me out. I'm not lost sense of the context here. The answer is not, so be more self-righteous. The answer is not, so go be better. The point of it is that he needed to understand and we need to understand that apart from the righteous work of Jesus Christ, we all stand unrighteous in the eyes of the Father. And it's meant to lead us to a desperate clinging to the one who was righteous on our behalf. We all need a Savior because we are incapable of meeting the right standards of God. Paul understood this. Here's a man who came to know Jesus Christ after persecuting the church. And Paul was a religious leader, a Pharisee, a guy who directed in the laws of the Old Testament. And Paul wrote this in his letter to the Philippians. He says, Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee. He says, listen, I am a full-blooded Israelite. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. If anybody has any standing as an Israelite, it's me. He says, a Pharisee, I kept the law. He says, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness that is in the law, blameless. He's looking at the things that according to Jewish law and tradition, he kept them and went above and beyond other people. But out of that, he says, it's all rubbish. It's trash in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ. Then he would write a letter to a young pastor named Timothy, and in it he says this, I give thanks to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man, but I received mercy because I acted out of ignorance and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. But I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. So on one side, where his measurements are other human beings, he says all that stuff is rubbish. When he looks at it from the standpoint of his measurement in the eyes of a holy and righteous and perfect God, he says, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an ignorant man. Thanks be to God that his grace came into my life, the worst of sinners, so that God's patience could be displayed to others. He understood that there are fatal flaws to self-righteousness and pride and calls us, as Jesus calls us, to recognize that humility is exalted by God. There's contrast. So Jesus goes on in the story and speaks to the tax collector. He says, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You see, even in his, in his demeanor, you think about culturally, The Pharisees were the elite of the elite. The the whole community looked at them as bastions of righteousness. And tax collectors were so evil in in their mindset that they gave them their own tax bracket, their own bracket of sinfulness. These individuals are so sinful because they have traitorously stolen our money and given it to the very powers that oppress us. They gave them their own bracket of sinfulness. And Jesus shows the contrast of these viewpoints. Here's this Pharisee in great arrogance standing before God, speaking of himself, but in very posture, the tax collector has a d- demeanor of humility. Both are standing. It's common in Jewish practice to stand to pray. But notice he stands far off with his head bowed. He can't even look up to the heavens, and he beats his chest saying, God, Forgive me, have mercy on me, for I am a sinner. His posture is one of humility, and he recognizes two things. Two things that you and I must know. We are sinners. We need God's mercy. 
These two things must be known if we are going to find the salvation of God. If I don't get to the place where I recognize that I am a sinner, I've fallen short of God's desires, and I desperately need His mercy, I cannot find salvation. And this man understood it, and he stood there and beat his chest. Here's a beautiful thing. Because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, we do not have to stand far off. This man stands far off, but because of Jesus Christ and what he's done for me, the Bible says that I can enter boldly into the throne room of God. With boldness, I can not stand far off. I can draw near to the God of heaven because Jesus was righteous on my behalf. I don't have to beat my chest. He was beaten for me. The beauty of this picture here is that Jesus would do what we could not do for ourselves and open the door of access into the presence of God because he would be cast far off. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He would be wounded and striped for our sins so that we could enter in boldness to the throne room of heaven. It's a beautiful picture. Jesus says, this man, as I tell you, This one went down to his house justified rather than the other. Because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. It wasn't the man who had false thinking that believed himself to be righteous and looked down on everybody else who was declared right in the eyes of God, a judicial term. It was the man who knew he was a sinner and knew he needed mercy, who was declared right in the eyes of God. God celebrates humility. He exalts it. He actually lifts up those who fall before him. I love the the imagery. Peter spends a whole night fishing, doesn't catch anything. And in the morning, Jesus comes along and Jesus says, hey, go out to this spot and cast your nets. And you, imagine, you can imagine the frustration in Peter's heart and mind. We've been fishing all night. But sure, okay. I'll do. And, and maybe that's a beautiful thing that we need to, okay, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense, but I'll obey you, Lord. And he obeys. And he catches the catch of a lifetime. And in that moment, he realizes who Jesus is, and we're told that he fell at Jesus' feet, and he says, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Guess what Jesus didn't do? Depart. He actually told Peter to follow him. He lifts up those who fall before him. John, another disciple, later would be be given a vision of what is what was and what is to come, and he would write it down. And in that vision, he would see the glorified Lord. And he fell on his face, and the first words Jesus says to John in that moment is, don't be afraid. We see it all throughout Jesus' life and ministry. He lifts up those who fall before him. He exalts humility. He goes on to say in Luke's account, The people were bringing children to Jesus to have him pray over those children, and the disciples were trying to stop it. And for whatever reason, maybe they thought that he's too busy for that. Culturally, children did not have such a high standing in their societal structure. So they're brushing him aside, and Jesus rebukes them and says, don't stop the children from coming, for unless you receive the kingdom of heaven like a child, you will not enter it. I think Luke includes that story there because it's humility. Humility. There's a humility in childlike faith. There's a humility in a child who says, I trust, I submit, I will follow, I believe. And you may be here this morning, you might think, you know what, I, I, that whole concept, I, I can't buy into it. You Christians, you're weak, you need a crutch, you need something to carry you. I need you to understand it is so much more than a crutch. I need so much more than just something to kind of prop me up and help me. I was dead. And I needed someone to bring me back to life. And maybe even if you abandon the very concept of a God, you're sitting there saying, God, I thank you. You've not made me like these weak Christians. 
I pray that God's blessing continues to pour out in your life as the good God who gives good to us no matter what. But I pray also you recognize that the very breath you took in your lungs to proclaim that statement, God gave it to you. And He continues to hold you together. God exalts humility. Jesus said it Himself here. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Humility is not only celebrated, it is necessary. It is necessary because without it, we will find ourselves living in the same fatal realm as this Pharisee, trusting in ourselves, which is incapable of reaching righteousness, and looking down on others, which develops a measurement that is not an accurate measurement. So here's our next step. For, for today, for this week, if God celebrates humility, let's choose humility in all perception of self and others. So when you think about yourself, choose humility, not self-deprecation. Choose to see who you are in Christ and who you were without him. Never see yourself apart from that. And when you look at others, choose to see them the way Jesus sees them, to understand that they were uniquely created too. That you and I stand in the same place apart from Jesus Christ, equally in need of a Savior to buy for us what we cannot buy for ourselves. So what does that look like? If humility isn't just being quiet and having a perception of self-deprecation, what is it? Well, I've been wrestling through this concept of humility. I've been working on something. In my, my head, it's like, oh, I'll write a book, which is super weird because writing a book on humility feels arrogant, doesn't it? I'm going to write a book on humility. It feels super arrogant, but I've been working on this, and it probably just will turn into a sermon series. And we can't get into all of the depth of it. And I listed all S's because that's what pastors do. And, you know, some people may not love it, but to me it's sort of memorable. So anyhow, here are some things that digging through the Scripture I think are depictions. Humility is so much more. So here's how Google will define humility. Humility is a modest or low view of one's importance. But I actually think biblical humility exalts my importance. It's just finding it in the right way. So first, biblical humility involves submission. And I know we can't stand that word. And we've allowed society to hijack words. But it's basically just, I put myself under God. I am not God. He is God. And therefore, he is my authority. And he sets the direction and tone. It's submission. That's the, if I don't meet that first step in humility, I can't find it. It's been the struggle of mankind since the fall. You can be your own God. You can set your own rules. Humility begins with placing myself under the authority of God. The second is surrender. It's to give up of my desires and my rights, to surrender myself to the desires of God, all that I have and all that I am, to the Lord. Humility is also sacrifice, closely connected to surrender. Scripture calls us to put the interest of others above our own. To care more about somebody else's growth and our unity together than my own desires. So humility involves sacrifice. It also involves service. Jesus modeled that for us. He says, I have come not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. He displayed it to his disciples and that, therefore to us when he took a towel and he washed his disciples' feet. Every time I choose service, I choose humility. Every time I choose to serve other people, I choose humility. I think connected to that is serving with sincerity. Though I love the word sincerity in the Scripture. Often it literally means without wax. If somebody made a, a, a vase, a vase, however you want to say it, you know, if we're super snooty, it's a vase. Uh, when somebody made a vase, if it had a crack in it or it had a flaw in it, they would cover it with wax so to the naked eye you couldn't tell. You would have to hold it up to light to see through the wax. So if somebody made a vase without a crack or a flaw, they would put 
Ensensero, a sign on it said, Ensensero, it is sincere. It's without wax. So sincerity is, I'm not trying to hide or cover up my flaws. Here's the beautiful thing in scriptures. Jesus calls us to love those who don't repay us. Jesus calls us to serve even our enemies. James wrote this. Jesus' brother said, True and or pure and undefiled religion is this to take care of widows and orphans. Why? Widows and orphans can't give me anything in return. It's sincerity in my service. I believe that humility also means Sabbath, so keeping with the S's. Sabbath is just rest. You know what rest says? I don't keep the world spinning. Many of you men and women don't know how to rest because you think you keep the world spinning. You do not. You cannot. God has called us to rest because it's a reminder, it's a pause to say, God, you keep the world spinning. Thank you. Humility is rest. Humility is also sanity. Know your limitations. You are limited. Every, almost, most of us, some of you are a little crazier, but most of us, every 24-hour cycle have to literally fall down and stop because we can't do any more. We sleep. Yet we think, I got, I can do this. You are limited. And Paul says, in my weaknesses, God has proven to be strong. Humility involves sanity. And this is what I'm still crafting, I'm working on, I'm calling it sensibility. But I think there's this biblical concept of paying back what you owe, letting your yes be yes, keeping with your responsibilities, because in my mind, there's this idea that arrogance says, my time's more valuable than your time. Arrogance says, you should have to pay back the things that I've taken on. Arrogance says, you're responsible for my failures. And I think sensibility says, no, I made this decision. I'm going to let my yes be yes. I'm going to show up on time. I'm still working on it. But I think these give us clear direction. So humility is not just be quiet. And what's beautiful to me is the Scripture calls us to clothe ourselves in humility. That gives me the indication that it's not a trait I'm just born with. I'm either humble or I'm not. I can actually go get it. Through the Spirit of God, I can actually become humble. God celebrates humility.